<laughs> Welcome to seminar. It's with great pleasure to introduce Princely today, or Sally um, Hull, and she comes from Yale University, and she's one of our visiting scholars with the VSL program. She's currently an assistant professor. I have to look at all the different things you are, because you're many things. She's got three roles, which I find amazing. She's assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and she's also director of undergraduate pro studies in that same program. So a huge amount of service as well. And if that wasn't enough, she's also a curator of invertebrate paleobiology at the Yale Peabody Museum. And so she's a busy lady, and she has actually a really broad um, research background and she's gonna share a lot of that with us today. But she's also a VSL fellow. And of course then you guys should all feel free to discuss ideas with her, have lunch with her, et cetera. So she's visiting officially my group, but really unofficially <laughs> all of your group. So please feel free to interact with her. And I won't go into too much of her research. It's just to me, always cool to talk to paleontologists because they see the world differently. They see the world, world through deep time, through fossils, and they understand what's happened um, on earth from a really different lens, which is fascinating. And they try to also use this lens to sort of think about what might happen in the future. So with that, I will pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, I did turn this on. Oh my God, I'm gonna try and not be too loud because I'm a loud talker. Um, I'm really delighted to be here and I'm hoping that this is going to be the first of many conversations to come. So rather than giving just a pure research seminar that talks about what I've done in the past, I really wanna open up conversations for the conversations I wanna be having during this year. Um, so yeah, as Catherine says, please do come and talk to me. I, my, my great um, downfall is that I, I honestly am interested in everything. And so I would love to talk to you about anything and everything. Um, so yes, hopefully this is the first of many conversations. And to spark that off, I wanted to ask just a provocative question that you may find the answer disappointing to by the end, which is, does the rate or magnitude of climate change matter more? And matter more for what? For biodiversity, right? We're here in the biodiversity seminar. Does it rate or change matter more? And I don't know about you, but I have found the last year or two truly, oh, I like to point with this, the poor Zoom people. How many Zoom people do we have? Oh, 22, okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'll switch to this one. <laughs> All right, so um, this summer, the last couple of years have been really shocking for climate change, or at least to me, we all expected it, but I expected it in the 2030s, not 2023. And so this is just a, a map um, from not ESA Ecological Society of America, but the European Space Agency about um, uh, land surface temperatures just in this July. And you see uh, it recording uh, both Madrid and Rome making it to 46 degrees Celsius already. These are extremely hot temperatures. And the people, especially in Europe, which doesn't have the infrastructure for this type of temperature. Um, and so I really wanna get into you know, what this means uh, to live in this really hot and warming planet. And of course, I put this picture here so I wouldn't forget, and I almost did, that climate change is more than just about temperature change. Climate change has, correlated with the changing global temperatures are a lot of other things. Like I was actually on um, the Rhine when it dried out and it was shocking to watch it drop over the days. And of course this has cascading effects. There's lots of nuclear power generation on the Rhine and transport. Um, in America, we deal with things like changing hurricane frequencies, wildfires are spreading Greece, you know, had extensive wildfires this summer. So there's many effects of climate change, but today I really wanna focus on the temperature aspect of it. And just, um, I think everyone knows this, but heat really is one of the most deadly things that happens from the climate system, from a, from a, a, a human perspective. So um, there was a paper that was actually about heat mortality during the summer of 2022. I don't even know what it is from this summer, but in the summer of 2022, which was you know, over a degree cooler than this summer, um, there was something like 60 to 70,000 excess deaths in Europe due to heat alone. So this is a very deadly aspect of our climate system and our changing climate system. And when we talk about heat, what we mean by heat is not just the, the temperature, but we actually mean temperature plus humidity. Now, 
I got this, you know, you know, how you perceive the climate around you is moderated by how wet the air is. I got firsthand experience of this this morning. My husband promised it wasn't raining. It wasn't really raining, but you guys live in a cloud here. It was misting. <laughs> so it was like 100% humid. Um, and for humans, our ability to dissipate heat is actually, most of our heat dissipation comes through evaporation. So 75% of our heat dissipation comes through evaporation on, on average. Um, and so it's not the temperature that matters. It's actually something called the wet bulb temperature. And for all of you old fashioned people have had this sling psychrometer, this, you know, this, um, it's basically a thermometer, an old fashioned thermometer wrapped in, in wet cotton. And so how quickly the, uh, water evaporates from that, that cotton bulb tells you how humid the air is. And so wet bulb temperature, basically you're subtracting the, from the actual temperature based on how, how humid it is. And what I'm showing you here is a map of the maximum wet bulb temperatures around the globe. And what you see is that the pattern of, of wet bulb temperatures is different than the pattern of just dry temperature. And I'm actually from this part of the United States over in Ohio here. And like we always thought in the summer, oh my God, it's the hottest place on earth. And it turns out it, it basically is, right? <laughs> because it's very humid. And for humans, it, we know that actually for us, our internal body temperature is around 30, 37. But when wet bulb temperatures get above, actually above 32, between 32 and 35, we don't dissipate heat enough. And so we actually slowly cook ourselves. And this is true of all mammals. This is true of birds. This is true of any endotherm. And um, in our warming climate, the world that we're warming, um, we very quickly are getting into wet bulb temperatures that are exceeding uh, the internal temperatures of, of, of mammals, where mammals can no longer dissipate heat. So what I forgot to tell you on this previous slide is nowhere in the world today or actually just a few places starting now, do wet bulb temperatures exceed the thermal limits for mammals? We evolved in this planet that was just right for us. <laughs> and so now as we're getting into warmer climate states, um, wet bulb temperatures in significant portions of the world are too hot to survive if you're, if you're a mammal or a human. So with two degrees Celsius of warming, this is a paper that just came out, actually I think within the last month, Bacello et al. and PNAS. So two degrees of warming, you see these regions, oh, this thing is killing me. These regions over here in Africa and India and China are having um, a number of hours. So on the order of 24 to 112 hours a year that exceed the ability of humans to dissipate heat. And so these are areas where if you're exposed to heat for more than a few hours, humans typically die. And um, with four degrees warming, you have, you know, really large portions of, you know, North America and South America joining, you know, much greater areas of Africa um, and Asia. And so an easier, uh, an easier plot to look at is actually the relationship between global warming and the number of people in billions exposed to one week, one month, or three months of heat extreme heat, heat that we can't, you know, that we can't actually survive when exposed to. And you see that um, uh, with, you know, two to four degrees of warming. With four degrees of warming, you have, you know, something like 500 million people exposed to three months of unsurvivable heat, which is just shocking. And the reason why I didn't even show you the maps for one degree or 1.5 degrees is that ship has really sailed for us right, as humans. Like we're in the two to four degree realm. Um, so uh, this is, you know, this is really ex extreme. And um, this raises the question, you know, is adaption to a planet with several degrees of Celsius, that's several degrees Celsius even possible? Can we survive in planets like this? And so far I've just been talking about humans because I think we have a very visceral connection to heat. But it turns out that people have been very busy, perhaps many of you have been very busy looking at the thermal tolerance of organisms as well. And it turns out that organisms that live in the hottest parts of the planet seem to show the same limits that, that, that we have. So when you go to the tropics, plants and animals, endotherms and ectotherms appear to be right up against the thermal limits. So this isn't just a question of, is that adaptation for, for people possible? Because we can, you know, maybe dig tunnels, 
get air conditioning. You know, Bill Gates is obsessed with air conditioning. You guys really need air conditioning in Europe. <laughs> I almost died in late August um, here in Switzerland. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, so it's a question for all organisms, for biodiversity as a whole. And so that's the question I want to get into in this talk, and that's the perspective I want to take. And we're going to do it in, in a couple different parts. As I said, I want this to be the beginning of a conversation. So I'm going to take a brief pause now and actually tell you a little bit more about my background that Catherine started to give, just so you know all the different topics I deal with, so we can talk more for the rest of the year. And then we'll jump back into this talk. First, we're going to talk about you know, absolute limits like upper thermal limits by looking into the past and thinking about planets where the temperature was actually 10 degrees or more hotter than the present day. Then we're gonna think about rates of change by looking at two really extreme rates of changes in the fossil record. Um, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Max. How many people have heard of the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum? Oh, awesome. Okay, I give a very basic intro. So I'm glad you guys don't already know it. Usually I talk to people and they're like, oh my God. Don't tell me about that again. So, okay, we'll get into the best examples we know of extreme change from the past. And then we'll get back to these, you know, big, big picture. Is it the rate or the speed? And, you know, what you should hopefully remember from the talk. Okay, so my perspective, um, I'm an expert on mass extinctions and extreme climate events in the past. My, um, and I do this by looking at, at the actual fossil record, in particular fossils from cores in the bottom of the ocean. And the reason why we do the bottom of the ocean is because of something I learned best from my, my, my younger sister when she was getting married. I, I just, she, she and her husband got married on a mountain and they said, our love is like this mountain. It will be here forever. And I was like, no, <laughs> like mountains come and mountains go. Like the ocean is there forever, right? And so, <laughs> um, and mountains get washed away into the ocean. So if you wanna study the history of life, it's actually really much easier to do it in marine sediments. So that's why I work in the ocean. Um, I like to ask questions across time scales. I started out as a modern ecologist, but I most oftentimes work in, in the past. And I wanted to tell you, so I don't forget, that I'm leading this project to put together time series of assemblage or community change from the modern world and the ancient world. So to combine long time series, ecological and paleontological. So our first publication of the database is out. Finally, it took a while. Um, and it builds on biotime, which is a modern uh, ecological time series effort and adds in the paleo. And we have a bunch of upcoming workshops at ESTIF over in Leipzig uh, for a project called Is Time, where we're actually gonna be building on models that you guys all uh, uh, developed, the Genesis model, to actually deal with some of the nasty scaling problems of comparing patterns. Um, across records with different types of errors and biases to get out the mechanisms. But we can start to do really interesting things when we do this because we can start to look at essentially the um, amount of climate change and temperature and here in precipitation across different time scales. I almost have to point, this is just so irritating. So here on, on this end, sorry, red dot dot, on this end of the time scale, you're talking about changes that are happening on the scale of weeks to months to years. And over on this end, you're talking about changes that are happening on the scale, ah, on the scale of uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And you can see that there's different amounts of change in temperature. You know, the greatest amount of change in temperature is day, night, or seasonal. And then it takes a long amount of time to get the same amount of change in the whole system. And then you can actually look and say like, well, how much did plant communities respond to these different scales of temperature change? So I'm not gonna get into this in detail, but this is a paper that we're working on right now. And so I'm happy to talk to you guys about it, all you plant pe people. Okay, so I care about thinking about things about across time, which means I actually innately care about ecology and evolution and the feedbacks actually, not just the one directional push of the environment, but how organisms push the environment in turn. And my, my training is really in the ocean, although I have a growing number of papers where we're working on land, but it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here is to really learn from you all the land and hopefully share in turn my understanding of the climate system and on earth system feedbacks. And so I'm showing you also the organism that I'm an expert on, which are a clade called planktonic foraminifera found throughout the ocean. 
Okay, so that's my background and perspective. Um, hopefully that sparks ideas for things we could talk about. Um, and now I wanna get back to this question. Is it the rate um, or the absolute limit? And to get to this question, I wanna tell you what we know about the temperature range over the last 100 million years and what we see organisms doing, what we see biodiversity doing. Okay, and again, when we ask this question, we typically, um, an easy way to ask this question is to look to the ocean because unlike land, where you can be standing in the forest or out on the trail in the exposed sunlight and the temperature can be easily at least five degrees different. Um, in the ocean, when you get into the deep ocean, it's all the same temperature. And so if you're going out and measuring fossils, looking at who's there or using chemistry to reconstruct temperature, it is way, way, way easier to do it in the ocean because it should all be the same temperature. And the second major advantage of using the ocean to take the temperature of the planet is that the planet works like a giant heat engine. You have all this radiation coming in from the sun and way more of it hits in the tropics than the high latitudes. And so the earth is effectively trying to move temperature from the low to the high latitudes. It has to like move the heat. And it does that equally in the atmosphere as it does in the ocean, they're equal partners. And so the cool thing about that if you just study the ocean, you actually know all about what's going on in the atmosphere. And the atmosphere, of course, covers the land as well. So if we study the heck out of the ocean, we can know a lot about the land. And when we look at temperature through time, it looks like this. Um, I'm, so here at the top is uh, the present day. And here is about 100 million years ago. Oh, I keep leaving this off. This is a paper by Ali Friedrich, um, who's just um, over in Heidelberg in geology. It was published about a decade ago. Um, and he put together deep sea temperatures from zero to 120 million years ago from fossils from foraminifera that live in the bottom of the ocean. And he measured something called their oxygen isotopes. How many people here deal with oxygen isotopes or have seen or feel comfortable? Okay, a little bit. All right. So essentially, if you look at a shell, it's made out of carbon and oxygen. And the carbon and oxygen, the composition, the number of light versus heavy isotopes reflects the environment and the physiology of the organism. And so when we look at deep sea fossils and we look at oxygen isotopes, it tells us how much ice there is on the planet and how warm the water was, two things. And so this is a curve of both, but what you see is that here in the present day, we have this you know, Delta 18 of, of close to four and back here during these two warm periods in the Eocene and the Cretaceous, it's more like minus two. Now we can translate those isotopes into temperatures and it tells us something like the warmest periods back here in the Cretaceous were at least 12 degrees Celsius warmer than the present day. And so that's the perspective from the chemistry of the bottom of the ocean. And so you might think, oh my gosh, so it was 12 degrees warmer on the planet as a whole, but actually the deep ocean temperature is correlated to the surface temperature, but not exactly linked. And we don't actually, we have trouble making that translation as we go back in time. And so a lot of the research I've been doing with colleagues is actually really trying to figure out, okay, well, exactly how hot do we mean for the surface? So that's what a lot of work has gone into. And it turns out that it's really hard to measure surface temperature. We do it all the time and it has really big error bars. We're talking about error bars of like ah, five to 10 degrees sometimes. And so over the last five years, I've been working really hard with my team and a group around the world to constrain the error bars on surface temperature in the ocean because it actually turns out to be directly tied to surface temperature on land. And so we're met using a bunch of different chemical measures of temperature through time. Now, I swear in about three minutes, I'll stop talking about geochemistry of the past, okay? <laughs> I'll get back to life. But, um, there's two different ways that we measure them and they all have different biases. And so the key thing I want you guys to remember is not what all this chemistry means, but is that people who study past temperatures, we use lots of different tools. They're uncertain, but we look for the agreement between the tools. Um, and so what we did in my group was like, let's look at all the tools and all the errors together. And so we started out with oxygen isotopes because 
That's what's been measured for the longest. And this was work of a PhD student of mine, Daniel Gaskell. And we essentially went back over the, I switched the axis on you. So if you look at this plot, oh, where's my dot? Okay, this is zero, this is the present day. This is 90 million years ago. So we wanted to look in the surface ocean and say, what's the temperature of the surface ocean? The yellow up here is the low latitudes. This is like 30 to 30. And this, the blue is high latitudes in the deep sea. So the light blue is 60 to 90 and the black line is the, the bottom of the ocean temperature. And we looked at fossils that were extremely well-preserved. It's important for how you measure temperature. And we did a lot of fancy modeling and statistics and we, use, and we leveraged global climate models to come up with these curves I'm showing you in the back. Um, and if you really care about the details, this was published last year in PNAS. And the nice thing was we got modern uh, low latitude and high latitude temperatures that are like the, the actual modern ocean. And we were able to come up with surface temperatures for these different latitudes back through time. And so that we know that the low latitudes go from being like 26 today to 36 in the past at the warmest and one to something like 16. And so that actually tells us the low and the high latitudes are warming at different rates, which is something that we knew, but it was nice to actually see that empirically. Um, we didn't know exactly how much those rates differed though. So this is a great constraint on, on a big disagreement in the climate community. And so with that, we're able to come up with how much surface temperature has changed. We can say the surface of the planet really has changed by something like 13 degrees over that time range. And it turns out, oh, it's my slides off the top, that this is just one of the many different ways of measuring temperature. And so we're in the midst of doing this with other proxies, other measures of temperature. So the blue line is what I just showed you for the low latitudes. And now we have it with the red line. This is the upper bound from a different type of proxy called TEX86. This has to do with how organisms build their cell wall. Um, and so you can see that the estimate that I gave you so far is actually the lower bound on what we think temperatures are through time. TEX86 has, it does some crazy things. I don't actually trust this upper bound, but within the uncertainty of our science, we could say that these warmest periods may be as much as even something like four to five degrees warmer than what I've just told you. So instead of 13 degrees warmer at the warmest, it may be as much as 17 or 18 degrees warmer, which is really hot. You're talking about an ocean that's approaching 40 degrees Celsius. And the nice thing about this is that if we constrain the ocean, I can tell you what heat stress on land is. And that's because the ocean is tied uh, to, the, to the wet bulb temperature of land. And so what we're doing right now is we're calculating terrestrial heat stress through time for the globe. And we can do that because it turns out that uh, the ocean is so much water, it actually sets the maximum wet bulb temperature on land. So if you know the temperature in the ocean, you actually know the maximum on land. And that's just, you know, has to do with energy. And so we can actually look at this and say, okay, now, now we know that you know, in the modern, we get these maximum wet bulb temperatures because the ocean is that temperature. And then we can go back and project it through time. And so we're working on continuous estimates through time, leveraging multiple types of climate models. But it turns out that we actually had already modeled one scenario or Matt had mo modeled one scenario of a 12 degree warmer world. And I just wanted to show you what this looks like so you can start to think about the organisms that you care about. Because when it's 12 degrees warmer about 50 million years ago, the warmest parts of the world have wet bulb temperatures that you know, are something like well above, above 35 degrees, degrees Celsius, wet bulb temperature, and even approaching something like 37 or 38, which should be far too hot for mammals to live in. And yet when we look at these latitudes during the hottest parts of the world, we actually see really diverse assemblages in these extremely hot climates. So I'm showing you a map of uh, reptile fossils from 100 million years ago when it was 13 degrees Celsius uh, wet bulb temperature warmer. And you see that we have a lot of fossils from relatively low latitudes. And it turns out that if I showed you a, a map of mammals, that's the same. If I show you a map of plants, that's the same. So we know that it was you know, 13 degrees warmer, but we also know that there were diverse assemblages at these latitudes, which is really crazy, right? Like if you think about the modern physiology, 
you guys should be telling me this is impossible, right? <laughs> like you guys should be saying these latitudes should be empty. So I see this as a major question that we need to be answering. How is it possible that these things live there? And one of, oh, actually I don't think this, oh no, <laughs> my data is not showing up. Oh, well, this is really sad. Okay, so we did a preliminary look and I'm just gonna have to tell you what it looks like. <laughs> We did a preliminary look at the fossil record, looking at the relationship between um, the low latitude temperatures through time and the diversity on land at the assemblage level in uh, you know, 30 to 30, uh, 30 to 60, and 60 to, um, 60 to 90. And the interesting thing was in the low latitudes, there actually is a lot of data. This is so sad. In the low latitudes, um, it's really scattered, but in the low latitudes, uh, diversity at the alpha level, the diversity of individual assemblages generally goes down as you increase temperature over the present day. And actually that's not true at the mid to high latitudes, which is really kind of cool. This is something that's been published a lot in um, paleontology papers over the last 10 years, but we know that as you go back in time, you no longer have the latitudinal diversity gradient you have today. It actually becomes U-shaped. Um, and so this is just backing that up, but tying it into temperature. So it really, things are living there, but they're less diverse than they are in, um, relative to high latitude assemblages at the same time, which is interesting. Okay, so when it comes to this question of absolute limits, when we look at the fossil record, at least insofar as we see the temperature range going at the high end, it doesn't look like there's absolute limits in the last 100 million years, but how and why organisms are doing that is, is really sort of fascinating. And it's one thing to say that the surface air temperature was 13 degrees hotter, but it's another thing to say that the temperature experienced by the organism was hotter. And so those are the questions that I'm really looking to look at now in the next year and over the next five to 10 years. Um, something I've been talking about with Dirk and Catherine um, is thinking about the question of spatial refugia from temperatures. So essentially these maps are at a very coarse grain for looking at the temperature and the humidity of the planet. So thinking about how um, cold spots, a little, you know, little refugia from heat scale on different spatial scales is a wide open question. So that's something that we're hopefully going to be looking at uh, over the coming years. At Yale, I have hired my first dinosaur paleontologist to really refine those maps that I showed you of dinosaurs and of mammals, building on, on work to really say like, how diverse were these assemblages? Someday I would love to get into plants. I just started having these conversations. Um, plants are amazing. You guys know this more than me, but they have to sit in one spot and take everything on the nose. And so they have much wider physiological tolerances than, organ than mammals and, and birds. So thinking about this from a plant perspective is fascinating, especially because plants photosynthesis has a different scaling relationship with temperature than, than respiration. They shouldn't be able to photosynthesize when it's this hot. They should be like, they should be eating the plant, the trees should be eating things like at these temperatures, but they're not obviously. And so I think plants are a really fascinating, difficult problem that if people have ideas of how to get into it, it'd be really fun to talk more about plants. Um, and, uh, and another thing I have a postdoc, I have a theoretical ecologist that I recently hired thinking about dormancy. So essentially periods of extreme suppression of metabolism and how that varies and changes how organisms experience the environmental landscape around them and thinking about what the limits to dormancy are for avoiding extremes like this. So essentially this is a whole number, more, a whole set of questions and not answers, but it's what I'm excited about these days and what I'm excited to talk about. Um, and it really links between the fossil and the, the, the modern record. Okay, so with that, I wanna talk about rates. So that's what we know about limits from the fossil record, which is, it doesn't seem like there are limits, but why it doesn't seem like there are limits, I can't tell you. <laughs> so let's talk about rates and how rates matter um, for the rest of the talk. And to get into that, I wanna talk about the PETM and what we know about extreme climate change in the past. So the PETM is this really rapid warming event in the fossil record, and the KPG is the last mass extinction. That's the extinction that took out the dinosaurs. So we're gonna talk about both of those. So what I can tell you is that uh, paleontologists like myself think a lot about past global warming events and the analogies to the present day. And we know that when we go back 
in time, there's a number of warming events in the past. So right, what I'm showing you here is 32 to 58 million years ago. It turns out during a time period known as the Eocene, there were a lot of rapid warming events. Why you should care about the Eocene, if you work on, man who works on mammals? Any mammal people? No? Okay, what about uh, plants? Oh yes, okay, we're gonna get to plants in a second. Birds? Or is this all fungus? Fungus, okay, <laughs> all right. Well, in the Eocene, pretty much the roots of everything we see around us today really radiated like heck in the Eocene. The Eocene is a very innovative time for a lot of things that we see around us today. Um, and, and, and there's also a lot of rapid global warming events. And the most rapid of them is at the boundary between the Paleocene and the Eocene. It's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. And so I'm gonna skip through really quickly how we know it exists. But basically we have widespread evidence from the ocean and from land that there was a massive release of greenhouse gases that drove ocean acidification and warming. We can see it in the physical rocks and we can also see it in these chemical markers. As a paleontologist, you always wanna see things in the rocks because chemistry can do weird things. And so it's really comforting. We can see it in the rocks and we can see it with the chemistry and we can see it with assemblages. And so essentially we have evidence um, when we look at the carbon isotope composition of shells. Again, this is from the bottom of the ocean. We see this major drop in the carbon isotopes that is precisely timed with a major increase in the oxygen isotopes and a big dissolution event. See this brown spot in this core? That is where all the fossils have dissolved out. And we can actually translate those you know, from chemistry space into carbon space. And I've worked on projects that look at constraining things like the CO2 and temperature of this transition and the timing. And we can actually say, okay, we know that this is a five to six degree global warming event and that it occurred over something like 3000 to 5,000 years. So I've worked on actually, it's really hard to get things that constrained in time, but so we've, we've really made big advances to say, okay, we're really pretty darn sure 3000 to 5,000 years. And this is going from a pretty warm background state. So you're getting to some of the hottest temperatures that we actually know um, uh, uh, um, at this time. So you're talking about land temperatures that are definitely between like 40 to 50 at peak, maybe even 60 in large parts of, of the planet, which is crazy. Um, and so what did it do for life? And so I wanna walk you through what we know about for life. I'm gonna talk through a couple things in the ocean, algae, consumers, like low level consumers, fish, and then we're going to move on to land and say like, this is a five to six degree global warming event, right? Like it should have killed everything, right? Like five to six, that's what we're, you know, like, we're hoping to avoid now because we think it's like the end of the world. Well, it turns out it, it was awesome <laughs> for, for life. <laughs> um, so this is a, a planktonic algae group. They're called coccolithophores. It's just basically a well-preserved algae. Um, and we care about it a lot in the, in the ocean. And the pink line, line is telling you the number of species through time. Oh, it kills me not to be able to point. But the KT boundary, they almost go completely extinct. There's something like, it's like, a, like over a 90% extinction in this clade. But here at the PTM, you can actually see they're getting more diverse. And that's because if you look at originations versus extinctions, you see that there's slightly more originations than there is extinctions at this time. And extinctions are, are not you know, particularly elevated. And so there's, and what we mean is that there's like three things that go originate and two things that go extinct. So this is really a non-event uh, from the perspective of the algae that are found throughout the world's oceans. And this is coccolithophores, but it turns out that if we look to other major algal groups that have a fossil record, this is also, also true. We do have some evidence that some algae may have been excluded from the hottest, warmest latitudes, but they, we also see them shift their range and then shift their range back after the event. This is also true of the consumers of those algae, which are the foraminifera I study. These are, are you know, single-celled uh, heterotrophs, and they essentially do the same thing. I, uh, I don't want to get into this too much, but basically what you see is that at the event itself, which is this gray bar, there actually is a big turnover 
in terms of which species are found at any given site, but they essentially just have a range shift and they shift right back with the, the warming anomaly. In my own research, I've looked a lot at um, their symbiont associations. So this group of organisms oftentimes has photosymbionts. So, you know, today with corals, we're particularly concerned about symbiotic associations with warming. And there is evidence that the density of their symbionts changed, but there's no evidence that it was, you know, well, just didn't kill them off. We just see them shifting their ranges. And interestingly, they shift their ranges all the way up to like Antarctica, which is amazing. Things that used to be found in the tropics are found in, in the high latitudes. And you think about it, that's kind of cool. They're tracking their thermal niche, but then they have to deal with like half the year being dark, which is another interesting challenge. Doesn't seem to bother them. Um, fish are also surprisingly resilient. People who study fish really worry about the effect of warming on fish. There's a close tie between temperature and oxygenation and uh, both of which, which affect fish metabolisms. There was a paper that was just published uh, a few years ago that showed that in Egypt, really low latitude, assemblages were just as diverse before and during the event. So there's no um, hit on the body fossils. And in the deep ocean, we actually look at fish teeth to put together what they're doing. And um, we actually see, we're working on a follow-up study to this right now, we're about to submit it, but we actually see that the relative abundance, sorry, I gotta orient you. Uh, so this is, oh, the age axis keeps switching. This is in the Paleocene. The PETN, the warming event, is like right here, oh, right here. And uh, this is the warm part of the Eocene. And you can see that as the planet is warming here, it essentially is, uh, the warming is the red line and the black dots are the fish. You see that as the planet warms, you get more and more fish in the ocean. It doesn't change their diversity at all. And if anything, they get a little bit bigger. So it's the opposite of all the relationships we thought that should be occurring with fish when we look in the past. So on land, it turns out that one of my colleagues, Scott Wing at the Smithsonian and many others have been working really hard to put together what plants do in response to this event. And there's a lot of great uh, evidence uh, from both pollen and the macro fossil record from leaves that plants shift their ranges. And so it's actually really hard to see them in this plot, but this is combining um, um, a model in a inter comparison project looking at modeled uh, Copen climate zones uh, before the event and during the event. And essentially with warming, the climate zones expand. And so that's the background color on those plots. And then the little squares are telling you what the actual pollen assemblages are doing. And so we can actually see that as it warms, the zones expand and plants expand to higher, higher latitudes. There's no evidence of any extinction, just rain shifting. And the really cool thing is all the organisms shift with the plant zones and they all disperse globally. So this is when primates actually made it around the world. It's also when most, you know, most of the mammal clays that we know all dispersed around the world at this time, which is really pretty cool. And the other thing that they do, oh, I took out the slide for time. The other thing that um, these, these organisms do is on land, there's evidence for certain organisms, particularly er early horses, uh, which I think the earliest horse is now called Sephrohippus, it actually shrinks, which is really cool. So when it gets warm, it goes from being about the size of a small dog to about the size of a cat, and then it goes back afterwards. <laughs> um, so the crazy thing about the PETM, this is a five to six degree global warming event um, that happens on the scale of over, over about 3,000 to 5,000 years, is it doesn't drive a mass extinction at all. It doesn't drive any elevated extinctions, except in a couple clades that I didn't tell you about today. There's a deep sea clade called um, Bindic 4 Minifera that do, do have an extinction. But at a global level, it's not a global mass extinction, but rather it's an interesting study in adaption and resilience to change. But the really key distinction from the present day is that it's slower by an order of magnitude than the present day. This is our best example, but it's an order of magnitude slower which actually makes the rate of warming super slow. <laughs> like it's so slow, it's even hard to imagine. It's like, yeah, so it's, it's much slower, which is why the other event that I study is particularly useful. So the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, which we do think is a mass extinction. People say 75% species extinction, although I could give a whole lecture why we don't know that, but 
it's a mass extinction. Um, it's bad for many clades. You lose the dinosaurs, um, you lose the ammonites. Uh, and this is a global change, climate change event that's actually much faster than the present day. So the cool thing is when the asteroid, cool for us now, not cool for them then, is that when this asteroid, which was you know, enormous, it's so big that when it smacked into the Yucatan Peninsula and like the, the, the leading edge of the asteroid was hitting the Yucatan, the top of the asteroid would have been higher than a 747 flying. In, you know, like, so if you were flying in an airplane, you'd be going like past the middle part of this asteroid, which is kind of cool, right? Like, so it's ginormous. And when it hits, it hits so hard, it digs out a crater that's like 200 to 300 kilometers across. And so it throws up an enormous amount of molten rock into the, to the atmosphere and ash and aerosols because it actually hit into an old carbonate platform and hit into an old reef basically. And so it throws all this rock up into the atmosphere and it actually rains, it's like fire and brimstone. Like there's, there's shock heating of the atmosphere. So like it gets something like 100 to 140 degrees Celsius on land immediately because of the impact wave. And at the same time, there was something like magnitude 11 earthquakes globally and a tsunami wave 100 meters tall hit the coast of, of the Gulf Coast of the United States, 100 meters. Most tsunamis that are devastating are like a meter, 100 meters tall. Um, and it rains fire and brimstone, but like hot glass. And we see little gl hot glass balls all around the world. So we know it rained hot glass globally. Um, and the ash, and the aerosols block out the sun. They completely blocked out the sun for at least six months. There's actually really old papers from about 30, 40 years ago debating based on plant, plant patterns, how long the sun was blocked out. And the idea is it could only have been completely blocked out for six months to a year, given that plants don't seem to take a hit. Um, but then it's probably dark. We know from geophysical modeling for on the scale of a few years, um, and then it starts to taper off. It starts to get less and less and less dark. But when it's really, really dark, the temperature of the earth is thought to have dropped by 20 to 27 degrees Celsius, which I actually find impossible because like the tropics almost freeze, like the tropics almost freeze, like it's, it's insane. So, and it happens on the scale of a few years, right? So over the course of two to 10 years, you drop the global temperature by 25 degrees and you do get a mass extinction event. And in particular, there's really cool survivorship patterns in terms of the organisms that can go dormant or have a seed bank of a various kind and the organisms that can't. And so it hasn't been fully explored in the, in, through that lens, but essentially a lot of things that survive, even mammals like have little burrows, they can just fall asleep and wake up two years later, potentially. So um, there's some really interesting survivorship patterns. So we know if it's faster and bigger, you do get a mass extinction event and the modern day falls somewhere in between. Okay, so just to wrap it up in the next couple of minutes here, when it comes to the question of, you know, is it the rate of climate change that matters? Oh. I just realized I've been, <laughs> I wrote this bullet point wrong the entire talk. Sorry guys, I meant to write rate or, or um, absolute, but I wrote rate or speed. So is it the rate or the absolute amount of uh, change that matters? Well, when it comes to rate, we know that the rate of change matters a lot, you know, as do other, condition, other boundary conditions on the planet, which we can get into. In the current rate of change on the earth is between the PETM and the, the, uh, um, the KPG. So it's somewhere between the two. So we actually don't have good ancient constraints on the modern day. We know that biota can adapt given enough time. But the question is, if you're on the scale of hundreds of years, you're actually right in this interesting in-between spot. Um, you're actually in an interesting in-between spot in the curve of how organisms experience uh, um, change normally. So I would say slowing down modern rates is perhaps even more important than, than capping the absolute uh, amount. And people are thinking about that with methane um, controls. Um, but for this question of absolute limits, I don't think we've seen them in the last 100 million years, but how and why this is possible, I think we really don't know. And this is, I think, a major, a major question uh, to get into. So right, I don't really have an, uh, uh, an answer to this. I do know that rates matter. 
I don't know the answer to the problem, the present day conundrum, but for absolute limits, I think this is you know, a big area uh, to, to open up. So the key takeaways from this talk, I just, the thing I want you to actually remember, well, since it's new to you, do you remember the, the PETM exists? <laughs> and we have other analogs in the fossil record. So if you'd like to know about other ones, I'm happy to tell you about other ones. There's lots of them. Um, I didn't even get into the Promo Triassic, which is another awesome event. So anyway, I could tell you about um, um, other analogs, but I think that we can get unique constraints by combining fossil inferences with modern inferences and ocean and land. And I know many of you guys are doing that, but I'm hoping that by being here, we can do that in other interesting ways. Um, and I hope that the talk really just sparks discussion on other topics because my favorite thing to do is to do anything but what I'm supposed to be doing um, she's talking to you guys, which would be great. Um, and I really am interested in how organisms are basically filtering how they see the environment through things like dormancy, seed banks, and how their you know lifespan sort of fits on this curve of background climate variability. So um, yeah, with that, I just want to say thank you. And thank you to my many funders. I showed you work from a lot of these people today. Um, and I'm um, very grateful to be working with everyone I've worked with. So thanks. And I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> oh, any questions? Right? Thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I have two questions. The one um, you've shown this interesting evidence that biodiversity increased under uh, very warm conditions. Do you have any estimate about what the effect on productivity was? Is it uh, coupled or is it different? I would assume, for example, in the ocean with less oxygen, there might be limits to productivity that wouldn't be uh, at cold, cooler temperatures. Yeah, no, productivity, I always think of it as like the great white whale of the fossil record. So, you know, like Moby Dick, he goes hunting for the great white whale. It like constraining productivity through time is, is the dream. And it's really hard to do. Um, on land, I don't think we have really any great constraints on that at all. In the ocean, we can start to look at it using models that incorporate different aspects of their physiology and testing it with things like their carbon isotopes. Um, but it's, it's really hard and not constrained. Well, I have a PhD student right now looking at it in the Pliocene, we're trying, which is just you know a few million years ago, but it's about four degrees warmer. And we're trying to look at how the change in temperature interacted with the change in currents because the currents actually also really matter for nutrients and light. Um, and it turns out that the modern global climate models are so parameterized to the present day, they, br they break when you go back. And so we've been rewriting that module, which is cool to include temperature dependent metabolism changes on recycling. Sorry, it's really into the weeds, but the basic answer is we don't know. Um, <laughs> it's complicated and I'd love to know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, I have a question regarding the, the rates. When you look into the paleo record, how often is it that you actually have the temporal resolution that you can see rapid rates comparable to today? today. Is that even possible? Um, five years ago, we would have said it was impossible to constrain the PTM like that. So to say that the PT, so the PTM about five, no, it's more than five. I'm just getting old. Uh, so it was 10 years ago. We thought that the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum onset over something like between 50,000 years or faster. And then there was a big debate that erupted because somebody said it happened in a year. And all of us were like, no, we know that's wrong. <laughs> and so we tried a lot harder. And one thing that I did was that I actually model um, the mixing of sediments using essentially advection diffusion models. So models that just mix particles together. And <clears throat> what we can do is we can actually measure the carbon isotope sig signatures of individual fossils. And then you can start to play games with mixing. Like what is the probability of seeing this signal given that it's mixed, given that I sampled 30 individuals? 
And so playing a lot of games, we were able to say, okay, given the distribution of fossils that we have and how it looks and how it mixes, we know it had to have occurred on something between 2000 and 5000 probabilistically, which is what we did in that study. Another way to do it is that if it happens much faster then the way that the carbon um, sinks into the ocean varies a lot uh, spatially. So there's a really big spatial pattern of carbon infiltration in the ocean and, and on land. And so if you independently look at that evidence, you also come up with the answer of three to 5,000 years. So we can do it in that case because we have a decent spatial coverage and we have certain special uh, and decent, I guess, models of how the carbon cycle is working. There are certain events further back in time that are harder to do that with because we don't have the record to do it with. But I think for the PETM, I actually think we really do know it's between, it's not faster than the fastest estimates are 2000 and it's not, it's, there's no way it's slower than 5000. So I think we actually do have those constraints, but our ability to constrain time like that varies depending on the event and depending on the driver of the event. But getting to like the scale of 100 years can be really tough. For the KT boundary, it's easy because of the giant impactor and the evidence for the size. But if something were happening on a human time scale, it would actually be really hard to see. There's also an online question which will come next. Well, thank you very much. For it was very interesting talk, and I have to say that I feel extremely ignorant now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm thinking about just two things. One is about this uh, warming and diversity. Yeah. So that somehow also this, uh, uh, what we are thinking about why in the tropics there is more diversity. So it's somehow what you presented, I think it might help to tell apart why, why there is more diversity in the tropics that, uh, faster rate of evolution with heat, more generations can fit in in one season and so on. So I don't know if this has been proposed or these people work together to try to understand this better. The other thing that I was thinking about, I found it extremely interesting, your uh, hints about uh, survival relate after the, um, mm -hmm. um, the major extinction event, survival related to dormancy and hibernation. Mm -hmm. So it was a gigantic selection pressure for mm -hmm. for these and i don't know if this has been explored which toxa survived and could bloom more on earth because of this big selection pressure and how fast the changes because i'm just saying i work with trees mainly mm -hmm. and there is not really seed banks but mainly seedling banks yeah, yeah. And, uh, but there is also some trees that have more seed banks as well. So yeah, yeah it, it sounds extremely exciting to think about this, how it changed the, the flora of the earth. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna do it backwards because I, I started to forget the first question. But for the second question, for the KPG, um, people have looked at survivorship patterns a lot in different clades individually. Um, and this idea, um, people have looked at different clades. People haven't looked at this mechanism across multiple clades yet. Um, so I think it's sort of there to be looked at. Um, but there are really, a mass extinction event is, is highly biased in terms of, like it prunes the tree. It doesn't equally filter out branches. It actually is very selective. And you do see patterns that at least are consistent with this. I gave a talk a few years ago, which I just put together all the like piecewise evidence that this could work. And like, there's a lot of lines of evidence that suggest this could be a, a link. Trees are really fascinating and plants are fascinating across the KPG boundary. There's not necessarily evidence for a huge mass extinction. There's a lot of assemblage change and there is you know, specific sites that do show, you know, what would look like a big extinction. It's the fossil record is so spatially patchy. It's harder for plants. Um, but there's an argument that it's at this boundary where angiosperms go from being, they, they get really diverse in the Cretaceous, but where they become very dominant on the landscape right afterwards. And in particular, you have this huge radiation like the legume group afterwards. Um, and that's, re they really go crazy in the Paleocene. Like why? You guys could tell. <laughs> like, it's really interesting though. They really go nuts. And, um, and so there was a paper published uh, 
uh, I think last year, the year before, they really made the argument about about this like shift in the relative dominance of plant groups that's really tied to the boundary and tied to sort of like their ability to, and there's a, you know, the, globally right after the extinction, there's a fern spike. I don't know if you know about this, but the, the, K, the KP, KPG boundary, it goes dark. And then essentially the whole world is covered in ferns for something like a few years. Actually, first the whole world is covered in mushrooms. Like there's like this mass, the massive like fungal spike, and then it's covered in ferns. And then these are on the scale of years and then the plants come back and then it's covered in plants, but with way more angiosperms dominating than, than what had been there before. Um, what was the first question? I, I forgot. Oh, the tropics. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I feel like these guys could tell you better than me, but, but there is like, I mean, one of the fascinating things to me is that if you look at these temperature zones, these temperature zones, like even when you get back to the Pliocene, when it's only like four degrees warmer, what we consider tropical like temperatures are extending like to these latitudes. So just the area of, the tro of what we would consider tropical like habitats is massive. Like it's just, it's like the whole world. And like now it's just, it's kind of like small tropics, but um, for, and that's most of the last hundred million years, the tropics were just enormous. Like we lived on a tropical planet, which is why I tried to take my honeymoon in the Arctic. So I'm like, that is the rare biome. That is the place that nobody, like that's the place that's only been around for a little bit, but the tropics, were, yeah. So, so yeah. we'll just take one more online question and then try to end by noon so people can go to lunch. Yeah, Christian Rickson is asking, um, has warming usually been slower than cooling because cooling was driven by asteroids or rapid advancement of glaciers? Sorry, two quick questions. And what do you speculate about refugia during hot times uh, on mountains in the shade of trees, which can toler tolerate such temperatures? Okay, so uh, that is a really fascinating question about rates of warming versus cooling. Um, because even glacial interglacials are um, like like they have a they have a weird sawtooth pattern um, in terms of how how rapidly they get cold versus warm. Um, so I actually don't know of a paper that actually looks at whether or not that's generally true, but I think it'd be fun to do. I think I think it yes, but I'd have I, I'm not I don't have a I don't know. Um, yeah, so I'd, I'd actually have to sit down and think about it a little bit harder. Um, for the question on refugia, I don't know. That's why I'm having a lot of people look at it. The one thing that I've been fascinated by recently is burrows, because like our mod modern world has a lot less burrows than we had even a few, you know, hundred years ago. Let alone, like I guess the um, giant land sloths used to dig burrows, like giant land sloth-sized burrows. Um, and the cool thing is when you get fires and hot times, we know that multiple different species that don't normally associate with burrows will be found in burrows. And so I'm really fascinated by like how many things would hang out underground because the ground is a great thermal refuge or in water. There is an interesting pattern in the fossil record that every time you get a radiation of, of tetrapods going back into the ocean, it happens during these warmest times. So like whales hop into the water during the hot Eocene. And that's also true in the Cretaceous. So like whenever we see tetrapods getting in the ocean, it's because it's really hot, which is fascinating. Um, I've been asking the dinosaur paleontologists whether or not sauropods walked up mountains and they think I'm insane. They're like, no, sauropods don't walk up mountains. So like, but um, I, uh, so, so yes, I think that's part of what we're asking right now is essentially where can you put the, like how many refugia can you get? How much can we push what we understand about the thermal landscape to find temperature escapes for organisms? Like could they have avoided what we think the temperature was? Um, so yeah, I think that's a big question. Good, so it's noon um, and we have reserved a table for lunch and you guys are all welcome to join it. I'm pretty sure it says reserved on it. <laughs> so, so yeah, sit there and um, if you don't get a chance to talk with Sally at lunch, she's around, she's right up. I don't know your office number off the top of my head. Okay, the second, third floor, D, floor D. Yeah, anyway. New Marco Moretti's old office. Yeah. So anyway, you can come find her there or drop her an email. Thank you very much again.